Greetings. I am Dr. Graciela Caneiro Livingston, Provost at Nebraska Wesleyan University. I want to welcome you to this year's presentation of Spooky Evenings. We here at Nebraska Wesleyan are excited and proud of this event that brings together scholars, artists, authors, and filmmakers to discuss the topic of horror in its various manifestations across the arts and the humanities. Professor Juan Jose Castaño Marquez and Dr. Matthew Jarvis have been working tirelessly to bring you the best scholarship in the field of horror through this unparalleled digital humanities event. I would like to acknowledge the generous support from the Nebraska Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment that helps make quality programming like Spooky Evenings possible. Again, welcome and enjoy this presentation of Spooky Evenings. <laughs> Tonight on Spooky Evenings, Leslie S. Klinger presents a talk entitled The Reality of Horror. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my guest, Leslie Klinger. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I've been eagerly anticipating this one um, because you work on so many different topics in horror. It's, uh, I, I, I can't get enough. <laughs> Um, so uh, for tonight, we have sort of a special format. Uh, Leslie's going to talk to us about reality and, of, and horror, and then we're going to transition into sort of a freewheeling discussion about various things, including his uh, multiple annotations. Uh, so I, I, I eagerly await pen, poised, notebook, clean sheet of paper oh, ready. Wow. No pressure. No pressure. Or should I say, no pressure? <laughs> I can't do it right. <laughs> so over to you, sir. Okay. Well, um, so when I was approached um, with the idea of, of talking about something tonight, I'd think about, well, what do I want to talk about? Um, do I want to talk about Frankenstein or Dracula or H.P. Lovecraft um, or... This is, I, this is an opportunity for commercial plugs, of course, or my newest book, which will be out mid next year, uh, which is uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and I decided that what I wanted to talk about was sort of the common thread among those books, uh, at least from my perspective, and what interests me as a scholar. Um, so to be really clear, I am not a writer of fiction, uh, at least not very much. Um, and uh, I am, I'm a writer of notes, and, and I'd like to think sort of an historian of um, 19th century literature, and to the extent that there actually were genre then, uh, horror fiction, supernatural fiction, and of course, mystery fiction, but we're not going to talk about mystery fiction tonight. Um, and one of the things that I observed, um, and, and I must say this came out of my years as a Sherlockian. So Sherlockian, a brief footnote, Sherlockians are nutcakes like me um, who have devoted tremendous amounts of energy to studying the stories of Sherlock Holmes uh, as written by Dr. John Watson. Um, and Sherlockians have for a century played what we call the game, 
which is that those stories are true. Um, how do we know they're true? Well, Dr. Watson says they're true. Uh, they were written by Dr. Watson, their biography um, or history, if you will, in, in a few cases. And so for a century or more, Sherlockians have approached those stories to examine them as scholars from that perspective. Uh, that is to say, looking for the reality behind the stories, uh, trying to identify the places, the people, um, all the things that we're, we know Dr. Watson concealed in writing those stories. Now, that, that's a little extreme. That's the game. But underneath it is a, an important principle. Um, so my discovery of this principle, and I'm certainly not the first one to discover it, uh, goes back to my high school days. When I was in high school, we got to pick a British author about uh, whom to write for our senior uh, paper. And uh, I picked uh, Ian Fleming. Uh, this was a very controversial choice because, you know, it, it was supposed to be a serious paper. And the, the, uh, the instructor said to me, you know, this, this better be good. <laughs> Uh, take on a popular author. And of course, Ian Fleming was, was uh, very popular at the time because that's how old I am. Um, and the books were still coming out. Um, there were still new Bond books being released. But what I wrote about was um, a word I didn't even know then that I discovered later called verisimilitude. What I wrote about was um, what we might think of now as the marketing aspects of the Bond books. Um, why is it that James Bond drives not a sports car, but an Aston Martin? Why? He doesn't look at his watch. He looks at his Rolex. It's very specific. Fleming went to great lengths to build into the books um, product placement, if you will, uh, specific products, specific identifiable labels. Why? And what did it do for the reader? Well, what I argued in my paper there in high school was that what it did for the reader was it drew the reader in by making the stories more believable. Those are pretty unbelievable stories. They're pretty fantastic that uh, there is this super spy who's doing these things. But when we are grounded in, um, in, in real products, real labels, and, and things that we recognize, it gives the air of a little more believability to the story. Okay, I don't want to belabor the James Bond issue because I'm not sure that how successful that was, but, uh, but I got an A on the paper. Uh, but the same is true of horror writing in general. And um, H.P. Lovecraft really enunciated this in, in some of his writing about the art of writing supernatural fiction. He described it as, that the writer needed to create a hoax uh, where 98%, whatever you, what percentage you want to say, of the story had to be realistic, regular, recognizable, all those good R words, with a thin thread of supernatural element. Um, and that that's how you sold the supernatural story. I don't mean commercially, because Lovecraft was terrible uh, at selling stories, but that's how you got the reader to buy into the story. So when you look at a, a story of Lovecraft's like um, At the Mountains of Madness, my favorite of all that he wrote, uh, when you read it, I, I suspect that um, from the point of view of uh, Professor Matthew Jarvis or, or other readers, this looks a lot like the academic reports that they're used to seeing except for the part about the creatures who died and lived and died, you know, 10,000 years ago. But other than that, it looks very much like an academic, dull, uh, um, no affect to the language, um, just sort of routine reporting of the events that are going on there until they come across some rather startling discoveries. Uh, and I think that story does really uh, an excellent job of, of selling itself um, as believable because of that, because it's all just so routine, except for the parts that aren't. Uh, and that's true of a lot of horror fiction, that the great horror fiction 
is embedded in the real world. Dracula is another excellent example. Um, very much grounded in modern technology, modern Victorian technology of typewriting and dictation machines and, uh, and, and modern medicine and the like, all of which leads the reader to be very comfortable with the story. This is a very recognizable world. It's not a big stretch to imagine ourselves in that world. It's hard, I think, for a modern reader to read Dracula because the people in the story are taking, they're so um, unresponsive. They, they, don't, they don't get what's going on. I mean, for the modern reader who has seen a thousand vampire films, reading that book, we want to yell at those people, you dummies, it's a vampire. Um, but the, the way the story is presented is very ordinary with that element of supernatural. Now, from the standpoint of an annotator, this is, this is um, grist for my mill. This is wonderful because what I get to do when I go through, and what I aim to do when I go through these texts, um, whether it's uh, Frankenstein or Dracula or Lovecraft um, or Jekyll and Hyde, or a number of short stories that I have uh, um, annotated lightly for the Haunted Library of Horror Classics, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend. This is published by the Horror Writers Association. Um, and what I'm doing as I go through with the notes is pointing out all of the, if you will, the reality of these stories. So Dracula, for example, has a lot of references to tides and train schedules and the like. Now, Bram Stoker was uh, the, the uh, essentially the business manager for the Lyceum Theater, Theater for Henry Irving and for that company. And so he was the guy who would schedule their tours. And so he had to know how to use the timetables and the tide tables and figure out ships and 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 trains uh and it's in the book and it's largely accurate in the book um but i spent a good deal of time running around trying to look up those time schedules and those train schedules and the tide tables and all that to see if it really was accurate and to let the reader know that it was because i thought that that had some uh importance Importance in the sense, again, of grounding the story uh, in, in a setting that is recognizable, comfortable, realistic. Um, Frankenstein, perhaps less so, um, although there is a good deal of the science of the day in, in that book. Uh, by the way, um, for those who haven't read Frankenstein, first of all, let me recommend it. It's a terrific book. But you'd be surprised to find out what a, what a tiny part electricity plays in that story. Um, unlike films where, you know, it's all lightning bolts and, uh, and sparks, uh, electricity is not a significant part. She had, the, she had the good sense in writing that book to really leave out the details of the science um, of how Victor Frankenstein created the creature because... She didn't know how, so, so she didn't put it in there. Uh, and, and that, too, is typical of Lovecraft, uh, by the way. Um, that sort of sense that the really scary stuff is the unnameable. It's the stuff that takes place, we'd say, off camera. Um, and we only see the reader's reaction. We see the, the, the actors, uh, the players, reactions to the horror as opposed to seeing the actual horrible thing that takes me back of course to being a a, a 10 year old going to horror films at the theater i didn't want to see those things on the screen i was happy to have my head under the seat listening to other people gasp and scream that was fine for me my imagination could supply what i thought that creature was going to look like and so that's another important technique that lovecraft and shelley and others have used in, in putting in the scary parts is 
it doesn't need to show the blood spraying everywhere. It doesn't need to describe in detail uh, the length of the creature's fangs or whatever. Um, you can leave that up to the reader's imagination. But so the great joy for me as an annotator has been to look at these texts and to, uh, to tease out of the texts the realities of those worlds. My philosophy has always been that a great, a classic, if you will, book of literature is a book that is an accurate mirror of its time. Um, that is, if you look carefully at the book, you're going to see a reflection of the era and, and uh, if the author is any good. Um, someday, somebody will be writing the annotated Valley of the Dolls uh, and in which they'll be discussing why is it that this person is looking at a watch? What's a watch? You know, we don't have watches anymore. Uh, but uh, so it's those, it's those tiny details in the book that interest me because of this, uh, this attribute that they create vers verisimilitude. It also is just a lot of fun. Um, my favorite footnote um, for Dracula, for example, is about a real thing, again, not something made up, a real thing that most people don't, didn't know about, or at least that today we don't know about. And that is, now you have to dig into the manuscript of Dracula to come up with this one. Uh, in the story, it will be recalled that uh, Dracula has come over to England on, uh, on a ship, uh, which has crash landed uh, in Whitby. And he, a, the people who see the ship crash see a large black dog jump off the ship and run off through the town. Now, we quickly know that that's Dracula. Um, that he's changed form into this large sort of wolf-like dog. Well, in the manuscript, there's a scene uh, in which there's a newspaper clipping that, that doesn't appear in the final version of the book, uh, talking about how a dog has been found with its throat ripped out in the village. Um, not our dog, but the victim, clearly, of, of uh, Dracula. And there's a line in the clipping that says, and the police were going to examine the eyeballs of the dog to try and determine who was the killer. I read that and I said, what are they talking about? Well, turns out that there was a genuine Victorian science, we would now say pseudoscience, called optography. There was a, a, a physician who had this notion that the retina acted like a pinhole camera. And when in the moment of death, it would retain the last image on the retina that, that was recorded. Uh, and so you could examine the retina and see what the victim had seen at that time. Jules, Jules Verne, in fact, wrote a whole novel in which the solution of the crime turned out to be doing exactly that. Uh, so, you know, it's like, what? But there it was. And that was a reality of Victorian science that would have been recognizable to the readers. I'm not sure why it got cut from the final manuscript, but it did. But um, that, that's my favorite footnote in all of Dracula, just because I thought, wow, this is, this is really interesting stuff. Interesting to me, anyway. So this is why I always think of myself as less than a real academic, because I get excited about these little things in these texts instead of worrying about themes and structures and all that. I'm interested in the details. I'm very, very interested in the details of every single story. Uh, and so, for example, in Lovecraft, um, Lovecraft was an avid amateur astronomer. And um, there are many astronomical references in the stories. And by and large, they're accurate. They're accurate because he cared about that stuff. Uh, he cared about the science of uh, paleontology and archaeology. And so he put in many, many elements that he didn't need to put into the stories, but they make them work better because they have so many details that are scientifically or just they're accurate. They're accurate details reflecting the real world of the time. 
Um, so that's one of my great joys as an annotator is reading the text really slowly and finding those little tidbits as you go through. Um, is it the only way to write uh, horror or, or um, supernatural fiction? Clearly not. Um, one of my favorite uh, books of the day of today is uh, Piranesi by Susanna Clark. If you haven't read it, it's wonderful. Uh, it's scary. Is it horror? I'm not sure if it's horror or fantasy or what, but it's very disconnected to reality. That's okay. It's a different idea. Um, it's almost like a really bad dream. Um, and But dreams are a good example because dreams often are keyed off on reality. They, they take little bits of our the texture of our lives and they weave them into new stories. And, and that's why sometimes dreams really draw us in because they seem so real. Um, so I'm, I'm rambling around here talking about these various books. I, I'm not sure that I have a lot more to say about the importance of reality, just that it's there. And I think that it's often a surprise to readers when they read what they think of as supernatural fiction and find how, not how little imagination is in those stories, but how measured the imaginary is. Um, how carefully the authors have woven in the imaginary, the supernatural into a real story that makes it grab us. Matthew, you've been longing to interject some questions there, I could see, so. Uh, well, I have some from students that I wanna to get to because I really wanna get into the weeds uh, and Dracula with you. But before I do that, uh, a couple of things I did note down. I do want to, uh, since you started with Ian Fleming and James Bond, I want to start there too. Uh, and I'll start with the first one, which is Casino Royale. Um, the thing that strikes me in reading that uh, isn't the, um, the, the watch, the, or the Aston Martin thing. It's how often, and this is in juxtaposition to the films, how often James Bond eats in the books, um, which of course relates to rationing at the time. Yes, and uh, probably, so um, Lee Child, my, my friend Lee Child, who's written all the Jack Reacher books, um, has lots and lots of scenes in his books in which Reacher drinks coffee. Mm. And he, he has said to us many times, when you find a scene where he's drinking coffee, that's me thinking about what should happen next. <laughs> so maybe that's what's going on with Fleming, is that every meal represents him saying, you know, I need a break here. I got to figure out where, what happens next in the action. So I'll just toss a meal in there and I can think about the meal and then I can move on to the action. So, well, cause Fleming is sitting in Jamaica at the time he's writing these books. Yes. And um, there's a lot of butter in James Bond. He eats buttered toast really frequently. Of course, the, the, the big famous meal with Vespa, right? There's, there's, yes. but there's heaps is what this is. Heaps of butter on uh, chipped ice. Uh, that she spreads. And then, of course, you have the pate and the lobster, um, which, I mean, nobody in England had any access to, right? And I mean, because... That's right. Uh, but that's a, that's fits... a good example of, of, a, of a very um, sort of recognizable or maybe a little bit wish fulfillment recognizable. You know, we'd like to recognize that. Uh, recognizable for the average reader that can draw them into the story. It's like, wow, they can really enjoy that meal. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm glad you're a Fleming because I am a Fleming fan and it's, it's yes. actually my non-horror interest is uh, I, I like Fleming quite, quite a lot. Um, so I'm glad, yes. glad to be Well, there's, there's a lot more there. I mean, what makes those books enduring? And, and I I don't know how the sales of those books have, have gone. I don't know whether the, the success of the film and the, you know, the immortality of the character now has translated into robust sales. I don't know. But the books are worth reading. Yeah. Um, they're they're well done. They're very well done, and uh, they they're they're not just cheap trash. Um, although there's room for cheap trash in our world, but uh, <laughs> I thought that would be a good title for a book itself: "Room for Cheap Trash." Yes. Um, speaking of which, you, you you mentioned academic prose uh, being uh, dull and no affect. I like to think that mine is interesting and full of affect, personally. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, actually, and, and I want to tie back into what I was saying about um, the, the, the sort of the realistic writing style. Um, this also it is in part because many of these writers didn't think of themselves, you know, Lovecraft's clearly an exception, but certainly Mary Shelley, I don't think, thought of herself as a writer of supernatural fiction. Um, she was writing a story. And certainly when you read um, short fiction, the short story, the, the enormous quantity of what we would now label supernatural fiction written in the 19th century by so many writers, um, it's, it's the output of writers who didn't think of themselves as horror writers or supernatural writers. So, of course, the stories are realistic, but instead of this one being a romantic ending, it's got a supernatural ending um, or it's got a, a mysterious ending because that was just a natural outcome of their storytelling. So they were focused at that time, they were focused on telling really good stories. Um, and if they happen to turn out to be supernatural, great. Um, you know, what was Mary Shelley's aim? I'm not quite sure. That she certainly, I, I don't, she didn't see it, I think. And by the way, we should say this about Frankenstein. I don't think Frankenstein is a supernatural tale at all. It certainly, she didn't intend it to be. There's no, I mean, there's it's, no it's more religious, right? It's, it's, yeah, there's no woo woo in there. It's like, oh, how did they do that? I mean, you know, it was like, okay, maybe, maybe it's science fiction because Victor discovers uh, the secret of life where nobody else had quite gotten that far yet. But certainly, Mary Shelley and her friends couldn't have thought that it was that far off that, that we were going to have a full grasp of what life was. Now, here we are 200 years later, and we still don't understand. What's the difference between a dead thing and a living thing other than one's alive and one's not? Um, but she would have thought of it as a very realistic story, um, exploring a tiny what if, just a little twist in reality there. Um, and, uh, and now Dracula is, is certainly more supernatural, although Stoker attempts to at least explain what's going on there. Uh, there's this business about the devil and the scolomots and all that. I'm not sure. That's a little bit of mumbo jumbo. And it's just sort of tossed in there. It's like, okay, well, that's where he came from. Uh, we're not going to dwell on that. We just know this is another natural phenomenon. And in fact, that's really Van Helsing's uh, explanation. This is a part of nature that a lot of science don't want to think about. So a lot of scientists don't want to think about. Um, vampires are real. They exist. And so it's, those are both excellent examples of, they didn't start out to say, I'm going to write about imaginary things. They started out saying, I'm going to write realistic things and maybe there'll be a little twist. A guy yeah, who just yeah. happens to drink blood. Yeah, like you do. Um, yeah, Frankenstein. I mean, Frankenstein's really, I mean, to me at least, it's it's about the nature of the soul and what it means to have a soul and sussing And what it means to into, have a father. Yeah, well, that, I mean, it's definitely about fathers and absences of fathers. Yes. Um, but I mean, it, it, and also the way the soul provides a sense of intellectualism. I mean, again, you need to read Frankenstein to get that. Uh, Perhaps some of the play versions get kind of closer than yes. any of the film. Yes, versions. I mean it's always, I think, a great surprise to people who read Frankenstein to found, find out that not only does the creature speak speak French and probably Latin, but uh, has, is very well read and uh, is able to quote Milton and so on. Uh, you know, it's this is this is not some creature walking around going erg arg. Well, I mean, the whole, the whole story is mirroring Milton, right? It's mirroring Paradise Lost in its own way. Um, of course. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Everybody should read Frankenstein. And this gets to a, a general question I had for you. Um, Frankenstein, I feel like, probably gets the best adaptation with the Kenneth Branagh one. I mean, there's a lot of issues, but I mean, yeah. compared to Dracula and certainly compared to anything by Lovecraft, um, Right. Well, I, so people ask me, what do I think is the best Lovecraft film? And my answer <laughs> is always John Carpenter's The Thing, mm. um, which is the closest, I think. And, and, and in a sense, it's very much 
drawn from, I won't say based on, drawn from At the Mountains of Madness. It has a lot of that same feel. But what makes the thing so successful as a film is this exact Lovecraftian philosophy, about 99% realistic, except for the part where the, there's a shape change in there. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's the introduction of that little twist into what's otherwise a, a routine, uh, very rule-bound little world there um, in the Antarctic. Um, so Frankenstein, I don't know. There's so many uh, films. I mean, it, the, my own take on it is none of the films have come even close to, to telling the real story. And therefore, my favorite is Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein, because it's so over the top ignoring uh, while keeping many elements of the story. Uh, I mean, clearly Gene Wilder, who wrote most of the script, uh, knew his Frankenstein very well. Uh, for those who have read the book, there's a delightful scene at the beginning where Gene Wilder is talking about uh, uh, reanimating worms. And he says something about, what, you know, who am I to be interested in a pile of spaghetti being? Now, what he's talking about, the spaghetti reference, is to the word vermicelli, which is used by Mary Shelley in her introduction to the 1831 edition, when that's not what she meant. She meant vermi. She meant worms, but she used the word vermicelli instead. Um, so Wilder really knew his Frankenstein uh, when, he, when he wrote that script, and it's got so many lovely touches to it. Uh, and the same might be said, of course, of uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It. Uh, it's there's honestly my favorite Dracula film is probably uh, the uh, um, the Jack um, what's his name oh, my head uh, Jack Palance version oh yeah yeah uh, the, but uh, uh, which with the Dan, uh, Dan Curtis, Curtis yeah Dan Curtis's script because for one thing it finally explains in a in a serious and reasonable way. Why is it that Dracula connects with Lucy and with uh, uh, well, uh, Mina Harker? I mean, it, and this whole idea that Lucy is the reincarnation of Dracula's lost wife, et cetera, which is used again by Coppola, but not to any really good effect. Dan Curtis did it so much better. Um, but I, you know, I think in the Dan Curtis, too, you get the, the sense of age the best in relationship yes. to Dracula? Although the closest to the text is clearly the BBC's uh, Louis Jordan version. I mean, that's yeah, that's probably. the film that is... Uh, Jordan, you know, you can argue with the casting, but the script is really close to the script, of, to the text of the book. Um, not, th this is not the recent one for people watching, uh, which is an abomination. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> This is Louis Jordan playing uh, playing Dracula. Uh, two parts. I think it's, I don't know if it's four hours or what. But anyway, from the 70s, I think. I, th I think so. Uh, uh, really worth looking for. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, these stories are almost by definition unfilmable. Um, as I said, um, the, the Lovecraftian approach of the unnameable doesn't work very well in movies um, to have all the action sort of be off camera. Plus, I, I like to imagine uh, my friend uh, Guillermo del Toro pitching his version of the, the At the Mountains of Mad at that. This, I, I have this in my, scene in my head of him meeting with the studio executives when he's explaining this film and how he's going to do it. And they say to him, so tell us who you have in mind for the female all lead. Right. And he says, there is no female lead. And they say goodbye uh, <laughs> because, you know, it's just it's never going to get made in a version without a woman in the cast. So but so Lovecraft, I don't have high hopes of, of any Lovecraft films. Um, the good productions are the are the HP Lovecraft Historical Society's um, productions. They are very good. Uh, they're short. You can find them. I think some of them are on YouTube, I think. Or their um, website. Yeah, and you can buy DVDs of them. They're very well done. They're period films. They're period 1920s, 1930s, uh, and uh, very true to the stories. But it's just inherently extremely difficult to do those stories. 
Um, to that point, one of the uh, my favorite reviews of the recent Color Out of Space was the color is magenta. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the best of a long series of not very good ones. Uh, you know, and that's not. I like the German praise. one a bit. I think the German yes, one. Yes, yes, uh, uh, yeah. That that's worth seeing. Uh, and there are many Lovecraftian films, but uh, it's you know they don't have to involve tentacles. Um, although I must say that uh, one of my favorite discoveries was uh, when I was researching Dracula, uh, Lovecraft was finding the edition of the Booty Call of Clulu, uh, which uh, has a picture on the cover of a naked woman with tentacles wrapped all around her and all that. This is tentacle porn. I didn't know that this existed, <laughs> but apparently it's a whole subgenre. Tentacle I'm not, porn. I'm not surprised now that you say it. I mean, you live in California. You should definitely right. be surprised. Right. Well, <laughs> so the other, the other thing I always mention is people ask me what was the scariest thing I found when I was researching Dracula. And I say the answer is I found a magazine called Bite Me, which is uh, it's the Journal of Consensual Vampirism. And basically it's uh, ads for where to find a dentist who will file your teeth and where to get the red contact lenses, and how to meet up with other people who are into consensual blood drinking and all that. That scared me. <laughs> Uh, you said the uh, Mountains of Madness uh, at the Mountains of Madness is your favorite uh, Lovecraft. My favorite is uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth, um, which Lovely I think is story. actually, I don't get why that one hasn't had a film. I mean, you have, um, uh, what movie is it? Is it Dagon that rips, that uses the plot? Right. Um, yeah, you could is, do it because it's not, um, it's not really overt. You don't have to show scary stuff. Well, it's uh, the only one with an action sequence. Right. <laughs> And and you can you can just hint with shadows and all that that there's something a little off about these people. Uh, I mean, obviously there have been other horror films that have done that, where somebody has gone to a town or whatever, where the residents just seem a little off, and maybe they're not going to get out alive. Uh, See, I, th but, I think Wes Anderson could do an amazing Shadow of Earnsmith. I'm just going to put that out there. If no doubt it, <laughs> choosing the best of lovecraft is is daunting though i just uh, uh, another commercial plug um uh, norton is putting out uh, a paperback uh, volume trade paperback volume in i think march called the call of clulu and other stories and it was they asked me to pick the 10 best stories and then move my notes um, into uh, into this volume so that we could put out a sort of look, student edition, if you will, uh, a, a less expensive edition, no pictures to speak of. Um, and of course, Call of Clulu, Shadow Over Innsmouth, uh, Dunwich Horror, um, the other, um, I'm not sure I can remember them all, Music of Eric Zahn, um, Blanking Colorado Space. I really like uh, the, well, the one about the artist. It's one of my favorites. Oh yes, the horror, horror, um, horror of, in the of the, Haunter of the Dark. Haunter of the Dark. Uh, is that the one you mean? Oh, you mean Pickman's model? Pickman's model. That's the one ah. I love. I, maybe because I'm an art historian. It didn't make the cut. It didn't ah. make the cut of this volume, but uh, it, that is a great story. But. Um, I think uh, that's the most Lovecraftian. Like, if you want to get to a thesis about Lovecraft, and I posed this to Joshi last year, um, I think that that reveals a thesis of Lovecraft because it's it's the absolutism, and it's in Dracula too, and it's a lot of this nineteenth century stuff. Because I, I I think of Lovecraft as being very much the latency oh, of Romanticism, absolutely. But Pickman's model reveals the ancient versus the modern because it's through this photograph at the end that the horror is revealed. And I yes, yes, I think that's fantastic. Very very well done. Uh, and uh, you know the but but again typical of Lovecraft it seems like a very sort of normal thing up until you get that last little element uh there so uh so many of his stories are like that but um Lovecraft is Lovecraft is an interesting uh subject to teach these days I suspect um I, I'm not sure that uh administrations are all that sympathetic to a writer who is uh, so racist um but uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm curious what your experience is. In I, I haven't taught Lovecraft, to be honest. I thought so. I'm, I'm teaching this um, 
the class that I'm using your book in, um, which is a, a, actually a first year seminar, uh, and I'm doing it on Dracula. I, I had proposed three possible things I would do. One was Twin Peaks, which my coffee mug from the R&R &R Diner. Uh, one was Dracula and the other was Lovecraft. And um, it was thought that Dracula would be the most accessible. So, but Dracula, I mean, you know, there's a lot of problematics in Dracula as well. Oh, no doubt. Oh, there's a lot of, well, there's, there's interesting uh, feminist issues in Dracula. Um, you know, I, I always say uh, when asked that Mina Harker is the hero of the story. Uh, oh, absolutely. No doubt about it. And um, the contrast between her and Lucy is, is quite sharp. And, and you can see Stoker sort of struggling with uh, the, the, the role of women and the reactions of the men to her. But it's also about science and, yeah. and the responses of science. Uh, uh, poor, poor Bram, who must have felt inferior to his brother, the doctor, uh, and uh, ended up with, he actually, I, I think I mentioned in one of the notes, his brother actually read the manuscript and gave him a lot of comments on the medicine parts of it. Um, but uh, uh, it's a fascinating book because of so many things contrary to expectations. I mean, again, readers, modern readers come to it with such a depth of knowledge, they think, of vampires, um, that going back to well, it's not the source. It is sort of one of the seminal sources um, for some of these myths. I mean, for example, uh, I'm sure that your students are shocked when Dracula walks around in the daytime and uh, he walks outside wearing a straw hat. You know, it's uh, how can he do that? Why doesn't he burn up? Well, I mean, it's interesting, too, because we, we're, we're to the part now. Lucy has just died is where they're at right now. Um, like completely died spoiler uh, alert yes oh i know 1897 spoiler alert here uh but um you know it's interesting because there's this implication that van helsing makes in regard to lucy that she can't go out in the daytime i mean he seems really set on this idea of the nighttime but we see dracula out plenty in the daytime we see him right. leaving lizard fashion uh in the daytime we see him i mean my biggest mystery, since you're a Sherlockian, right? The biggest mystery to me is what is he up to in Whitby in the first place? We know he goes to a zoo, you know, with the whole Bersica scene, but it's like I picture him in like, you know, a seersucker suit strolling on the pier uh, right. and just having a summer British holiday that he read about or something in Whitby. Why does he land in Whitby? Well, back to Dan Curtis, he went to Whitby because Lucy and, and Mina were there. Uh, or Lucy was there at least. Sure. And, uh, and so maybe that's what drew him there. It's you're right. It's not well, it's not well crafted. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it makes, well, cause it implies something that happens in Harker's journal. And I'm going to pose this to you. It's not in your annotations, but I'm going to pose it to you as a theory. Dracula doesn't want him wandering around the castle. Right. Right. And most of the doors are locked in the castle as his door eventually becomes locked. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps there are other solicitors locked in the rooms that are further along in the process. Because who else did he buy all these houses from? Well, that's right. And, and we know, you know, we know that uh, Jonathan's firm has been handling real estate purchases. But the only one that's mentioned is uh, is Carfax. So, um, yeah. Were there other other law firms there? Uh, Dracula seems to be fairly far along in his English, by the way, too. So uh, he's he's clearly had some practice before Jonathan showed up. Well, I uh, talked to Kevin Wetmore about this, who who did a theatrical version of Dracula, and he was talking about Dracula on stage. And one thing we got into the weeds about was um, the absurdities in Dracula. And one of the absurdities I find in Dracula is the description of this strange accent that Dracula has when Harker meets him. And I asked Wetmore, and he agreed, uh, is Dracula doing a bad English accent when he meets Jonathan Harker? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and why? I mean, was, he seems to think of London as kind of a, uh, you'll excuse the expression, a nice meat market. Yeah. You know, there's going to be there's going to be lots of uh, fresh pickings there when he gets there. So, you know, he's he's trying to groom himself as a uh, as a shopper in the meat market of London. So uh, he, he wants to sort of blend in. And it's interesting to see in some of the early films 
um, where there is more of the London time. For example, in the Spanish language Dracula, um, the 1931, um, there are extended scenes in London. Um, and we see him sort of trying to fit into society there. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, he's a bit of an odd duck. First of all, he uses all that hair oil. And, uh, uh, but, he, do. but he seems to, you know, he seems to conduct himself well enough that he's accepted into British society. Well, I, mean, I, I conceive of Dracula being in four parts. You've got essentially what was Dracula's guest, which is the Harker right. the beginning. You've got the transformation and death of Lucy. You've got the mystery part, and then you have the killing of Dracula, the, the journey at, to trans the, the subsequent journey of the crew of light and right. the killing of Dracula. And it's the middle two that, with the exception of the Coppola version, did the least service for some reason filmically. They're not very exciting. Um, you know, they're, they're essential to the story, but especially Whippy. Whippy gets terribly over, overlooked. I mean, it's why. It's really good, uh, that whole yeah. business up there, and it's kind of creepy and all that. Um, you know, some of the films, I mean, Nosferatu gives us a scene of the ship, at least, but right. uh, but very, very few of the films do. Um, although I did like that. That was actually what I thought was the best of the recent BBC ones, was the, the shipboard stuff. Okay. Yeah, um, when the plot, well, yeah, when he's a passenger. And yeah, I thought of the, of the three parts, three parts, that was the best of them. But uh, oh, absolutely! Just, it was it was so whacked. I mean, it was yeah. just so you know. It was another example of uh, we can do this better than the original author did if we just rethink it all. So yeah. uh, this is I, I although I love Mark Gatiss is a friend and um, I think he's a wonderful writer. I was never a big fan of the BBC Sherlock because I okay. thought that they just got full of themselves and sort of took it off the rails. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's a whole I other. I love the Moriarty performance in that, though. I have to say, yes, yes. Well, that yes, a Andrew. Scott I love was an eccentric really performance. Good. Yes, he was kind of over the top, no <laughs> doubt. But um, but back to back to the horror uh, filming and and the stories. Uh, Frankenstein is also very difficult to do uh, any sort of good story about it because it's first of all it's long. I mean, it's just. There's a lot of story to tell. And so to do a two hour film, you basically they cut out most of the story always. And it, it's always focused on just sort of the, the middle parts of, okay, the creature has been created and then he gets, and then he runs off by himself. And it's not very, what's the word, filmic, you know, to see this poor creature struggling um, to find somebody to talk to him and feed him and things like that. I mean, it's just, it's not very exciting. It's essential to the story. Not very exciting for a film. Um, it's essential to the book. But do you need like, uh, a, like a Tchaikovsky version or something, right? <laughs> it's like slow, meditative, suffering, yeah. Soviet realist version of uh, Frankenstein. Right. But it's so beautiful. So I, I should have said another thing by the way about annotating that um as is evident from uh, looking at all of my books one of the things that fascinates me always as well is the text and changes in the text um and i'm always particularly interested in looking at sort of the author's original ideas or sort of the first thoughts and how they got revised and refined and discarded and so on in, in various versions so um, Frankenstein is wonderful for that because there's so many texts. There's basically five. There's the manuscript. There's the 1818. There's the 1822. There's the 1825. There's the 1831. Uh, and, um, and Dracula has some exciting things too if you get to see the manuscript uh, and, and, and Stoker's notes, which... Um, so the notes now are out there, and I, I hope you sh you've shown me those to your students. Um, the uh, uh, I, I don't know are they actually up on the internet, but they're they're um, they're available. You can buy them, um, and of course I refer to them extensively in my footnotes. Uh, the manuscript I have a lot of notes about what 
the manuscript had that the text didn't and what the text had that the manuscript didn't and so on. Um, and it's more difficult to do that with Lovecraft. They've done it to some extent with Lovecraft, a great deal of it with Jacqueline Hyde. Um, Jacqueline Hyde, there are, again, there are three different versions that one can uh, collate and I've tried to do that. Um, but, and I, I hope readers think that that's interesting um, to see the creative process and to see sort of what gets kept and what gets lost. Uh, I also did that, by the way, in my annotated American Gods. Uh, Neil Gaiman was kind enough to share with me early drafts of the book um, when I was, and I was able to sort of put into the notes a lot of things about what changed. So uh, a question we have is, um... Do you think it's hard to make these films because of a fixation with horror as opposed to just filming the stories as the author wrote them? I think it's hard to make them because the authors had generally serious intentions and people don't want to see serious films. You know, they, I mean, you know, who wants to see War and Peace? Um, War and Peace, you know, what would it be? 50 hours of film or something? You know, it's a, like, uh, uh, what, what is it, uh, Berlin Alexander plots? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, it, movies have their own rules about um, grabbing the viewer and keeping them excited and interested for the space of two hours. And so when you look at these books, that, that was not the intention of these authors. That, that wasn't what they were interested in doing. And so you've got to throw a lot of stuff away um, and just get to the core. And so that's why, I'm not saying that makes bad horror films, but it makes films that are not what the author intended. It is interesting with Dracula, and my students have noticed this, is that each chapter pretty much ends on a cliffhanger and it frustrates them because uh, they, they like, I've already read ahead because they, they basically always stop in the middle of a chapter because they want to know what the cliffhanger's resolution is constantly. So he does have this episodic feel to the Absolutely. Chapters. And 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 it's drawn from, um, I mean, he learned from some masters. I mean, remember, that you know this, but I mean, the, the students need to remember that the great novels of the day generally had been serialized in newspapers um, and were, you know, the Charles Dickenses, the Wilkie Collins, et cetera, and they intentionally wrote that way. I mean, the, the, every chapter basically did have a cliffhanger or, or, or a hook to grab the reader so that they would buy the next installment. Um, so Stoker learned that from them, I suspect. And, and so it's no surprise that he used that technique. Um, he also does a really nice job, I think, of shifting POV um, and, and bringing in all the different voices of... Seward's dictation, the newspaper clippings, you know, Mina's typed up records, Jonathan's diary, et cetera. Um, it's, it feels very modern in that respect. Um, I mean, with the first quarter here with Jonathan Harker's diary, which comprises the, the majority of it with the exception of the letter from Dracula. Um, I mean, he's just the most unreliable narrator ever pretty much in that section, right? And, and well, and obviously intentionally so. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a young, naive, um, and badly misled about what's going on here. He um, starts speaking different languages that he doesn't speak at one point when the, when the peasant woman runs up, it's my child. The, the, uh, uh, one, one of the interesting things to me is Dracula's guest and trying to, the puzzle of Dracula's guest, sort of trying to figure out sort of where it went and what it was and all that. And I, I talk a lot about it in my, in my notes. I concluded it was the second chapter of the book that was eventually rewritten. But what, one, again, back to this point about texts, one of the interesting things to me is how many pieces Dracula, uh, of, of Stoker forgot to change. Uh, he forgot to change them when he made Dracula's guest a standalone story. And he forgot to take things out of the published version of Dracula that related to things that were in, Dra in that chapter. Um, so he was apparently in a hurry uh, when he did it. He cut it out and didn't do a careful job of editing. Who, um, who's cooking the chickens at Castle Dracula? <laughs> uh, well, 
could be one of the three sisters, you know, the three brides. Uh, we don't know. They, just because they're, uh, they're so seductive doesn't mean they can't cook. Well, this is one of my favorite scenes in Shadow of the Vampire, which I love. Uh, it's probably my favorite vampire movie. Um, yes. Because Willem Dafoe doesn't, as he, as he says in character, I would like some makeup. You don't get any. It's true. Willem Dafoe didn't really need much makeup. Uh, right. So... I mean, he talks about this and having uh, read Dracula, right? And it made him very sad, made, made, made the vampire and Shadow Vampire very sad because he had to cook this chicken for this man and trying to remember how to do it, how to make a bed again and things. Exactly. Dracula, you know, he's not a, uh, he's not a wholly a creature of horror. He's a creature of, he's 400 years old or so. You know, he's lived alone for most of his life. All of his warm friends are long gone. His family, if he had one, uh, is long gone. And uh, uh, and these women, the, the, you know, they've been pretty independent. We can see if we read Dracula's Guest. I mean, they're, they're sort of recent acquisitions. So he's been leading a pretty lonely life uh, for a long time, which is why Anne Rice and uh, and others have done so well with those tropes is to look at the lonely life of the vampire um, well they but, have this whole uh, relationship to like uh the greek um diana right they have this very profound relationship to the moon and things yes um yes that's that's clearly in the book as well i, I think that interested stoker the uh I was thinking about, um, again, I go back to Buffy and, and how carefully Buffy was written. One of my favorite episodes in Buffy is about the, uh, the young people who want to become vampires. They, go, they have their own little club where they basically pretend to be vampires and they're, um, they're going to be turned. That's what the big deal is they're going to be turned into vampires. And they refer to the vampires as the lonely ones. And um, yeah, I mean, I think... It's and, and we see that in in some of the more serious moments of Buffy, the, this lonely life of the vampire. Look at Angel, poor Angel. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting idea that you have these creatures who live sort of outside of the mainstream of human life because they have to. Uh, I want to ask you some student theories that we've discussed in class. Sure. Uh, are Lucy and Mina having an affair or some sort of relationship? No, not in my view. I mean, she's a, uh, remember, this is a, this is a woman who says, is it wrong to want to be married to three men? Lu Lucy is not, I'm sorry. It's, it's an attractive idea in certain respects, but I, maybe Mina had, uh, had some, uh, hidden desires for Lucy, but I think Lucy is clearly, uh, she is binary. I guess that's the correct term these days. It was sort of, I, when they talked about it, I showed them some of the, um, the Aubrey uh, prints from the time period that uh, from the late 19th century that get uh, pretty uh, sapphic uh, in terms of these modern women as friends. And of course their hair has like the streaks in it that makes it look like they have horns. Well, this is a, this is a very, masculinely sexual book though i think yes. um you know there's lots of penetrating and fluids coming out and things like that i mean it's very you know i i have the sense and you can tell from some of the early reviews of dracula that critics were quick to see that this was going to be sold as soft pornography this was going to be very titillating to the late victorian audiences and who would see this as sort of very sexualized um, well, the, the, there's I, two I other homoerotic pairings that my students uh, are, are curious about. The other one is Arthur and Quincy. Well, that's a little more possible, I think. I, I, that one, I, I won't say there's zero evidence of that because, but again, it, it you know this these are the same people who like to think that Holmes and Watson had a relationship, um, and I think that um, while I won't rule it out, and you may say it was culturally repressed they couldn't have a relationship but they had sort of the next best thing that we today call it a bromance you know mm -hmm. um and so i i think that's what was going on with holmes and watson and i think it's what's going on with arthur and quincy well, they actually they actually built this off of your footnote 
Uh, and it's your foot, yeah, so your footnote that says that uh, I, I think it's six days after Lucy dies, uh, Arthur and Quincy are off somewhere, as you might say, broing it up. And, uh, you know, according to Jack Seward, and uh, you, you say that seems really unlikely. <laughs> Yeah, I I think that um, the the a a male male relationship there um, a sexual relationship is possible. I think it's possible to read into the text. Certainly, given the uh, uh, what was going on in London at that time, uh, uh, when uh, there were a lot of closeted uh, gay men um, and obviously gay brothels and so on. Um, we talk about Oscar Wilde, but. Uh, that, that would have been very much on the mind of the readers, but but I think that it's a stretch. It's not crazy. Lucy and Mina, I reject. Um, Quincy and Arthur, maybe. Uh, I'd give it. Yeah, a I find the maybe. queerest character to be Van Helsing, and I find him to be predatorily so, almost like a Fagin character. Yes, uh, not quite sure what to make of him. His relationship with Seward is so strange. Uh, well, Arthur and- too. <laughs> Yeah. Like, you remind me of my dead son. You're so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, also, but, he wants to penetrate everything and everyone. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, they all do. I mean, they're all giving their bodily fluids to poor Lucy. You know, as I pointed out in one of the notes, no wonder she died. <laughs> they didn't have a clue about blood typing. Not so, at all. You know, Lucy's mother is the worst villain in the book, in my opinion. Oh, yes. Oh, you don't need that trash garlic. You know, get rid of it. Well, she's also... Uh, My favorite thing is Lucy tries to go to sleep in her room one night. No, no, you can't do it. Then, like, I can't sleep. I need to sleep in your room. (laughs) Like, this total opposite. Yeah. uh, uh, But again, remember, these people have no idea what's going on. So... If anybody had said the words to them, it's a vampire, you know, this is what you should be doing. Obviously, <laughs> things could have turned out, turned out a lot better. But uh, uh, Van Helsing, he was, he was circumspect about it. He didn't really come out and say this to people then. And so, and they weren't going to believe him anyway. He seems to have known it for a while. Like yeah. it, it, you know, he, he, I don't know how early he comes in with a vampire theory. I can't. Oh, I think he gets it right away. I think he makes that conclusion almost immediately, but he keeps it to himself to the detriment of uh, the the victims there. But uh, well, you can see in Van Helsing, if you look carefully, I feel like Jack Seward is the worst doctor ever. Uh, (laughs) I mean, he's he's Van Helsing's best student, but it's Van Helsing's best student in that, like, I think he's an experimenter like Van Helsing, to the detriment of everyone else. He's a psychiatrist. You know, what can you say? He's an early psychiatrist. Uh, uh, he gave up that doctoring stuff. But I love all the medicine in the book. I love the <laughs> whole scene with drilling holes into Renfield's head. and all. I mean, all that good stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's great 19th century medicine. One of the, I mean, that was the most fun for me, was going to the Wellcome Library in London and doing research to, to read more about some of the medical things in the book. Um, and it's very accurate uh, in terms of current practices of the day. Uh, I, I have often shown a picture um, of Arthur Conan Doyle um, a, a, as an illustration of Conan Doyle doing doctoring. He had, he had to examine a woman on a board of a ship that he was traveling on. And you see, it's not actually a picture of Conan Doyle, but it's a picture that illustrates this, where you see the doctor on his knees in front of the woman, the woman is fully clothed, and the man, the doctor, has his arms up underneath her dress, examining. Her. Right. That's the Victorians, you know. So, uh, so they had some handicaps, but uh, <laughs> no pun intended. But some of the medicine we look back at and say, "Oh my God, I can't believe they did that." Well, Seward also wants to go to everything as a psychological problem. It right. doesn't matter who, who is suffering. It's all psychological. It's his immediate diagnosis every time. That's right. Renfield couldn't be anything wrong with Renfield that a good uh, talking to couldn't help. I think. How does Renfield yeah. end up in the asylum? That's the other mystery. We well, wondered. I think he's, he's voluntarily committed. I think there's a suggestion he's a voluntary But he can't patient. be because he wants to be released and they won't release him. 
later they won't. But I think in the beginning, it said there is some mention, I think, that he's a voluntary. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, he's not crazy, right? He just eats things. It's uh, well, he talks. I mean, he he gets really self reflexive about that. It's like no wonder yes. my because fr- I th- I thought it was maybe his friends committed him because he talks about them having an odd reaction to him eating bugs. I I don't I think there's some reference. I have to go back and look. I thought there was some reference to him being self committed, but um, okay. No, I I I I I could be wrong. I just I've I've wondered that for a long. I mean, because in the other films, I mean, particularly the Coppola film. Uh, one thing that seems clear to me is that Renfield is actually the device that informs Dracula of where to like go to Whitby. She's there. Right. I know because oh, yeah. I work with the guy. Um, but that's non-existent in the novel. Right. Uh, um, but it's a nice idea. Um, but no, I don't, no, Renfield is struggling. I mean, Renfield in the novel, he knows there's something wrong. He knows that he's under an influence that he shouldn't be, and he doesn't like it. Um and uh, he, he struggles with it until eventually he finally gives in. But um, you can see his, uh, his resistance. You also get the sense with Van Helsing, like, the more I read it, I'm like, is Van Helsing a vampire? <laughs> I don't know. I, I have trouble seeing him as a vampire. I, I always picture Van Helsing as Ludwig von Drake. That's yeah. my problem. I, I sort of get stuck in this image of he's, he is so... And I don't think Stoker intended him to be comical, right. um, but he is. I mean, he's What's just that pigeon speech where he's written him. Yes. Well, there's so much dialect. I mean, and, you know, we have. Don't get me started <laughs> on the dialect in the book. Uh, it, it's a challenge. Uh, the dialect. I, I think writers generally do better to avoid dialect, but Stoker wanted that dialect in there, so he's got all of it. Um, whether it's Whitby speak or uh, uh, yeah, what's German. his name? Swales is that his name? Yes, yeah, Mister Swales. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, Van Helsing is also King Lear, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but I. So uh, this interesting idea that Stoker based uh, Dracula or, or envisioned Dracula as Irving, um, I think that's far oversimplified. I think that there are other characters that you can map onto Henry Irving, Van Helsing being one of them. Um, and uh, it's it's never quite that easy when you say, oh, an author based a character on this person. Um, it's always a mixture, I think. But oh, uh, on the other hand, was, uh, was Mary Shelley thinking of anybody other than uh, Lord Byron in certain parts of that book? Probably not. Same with Pomodori, right? The uh, the vampire there yes, is clearly yes. Byron. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you know, you know, with Polidori that uh, the book was actually attributed to Byron in the beginning. Of course, I, I just saw for sale an edition that had Byron's name on the on the title page, um, and uh, it went for a lot more money than I had. But <laughs> it was I think the uh, second edition of the book. So with. Um... I mean, I mean, Dracula more than, I mean, Frankenstein doesn't rely on any coincidences. Dracula relies on many coincidences. Um, you know, and we just, why are we so willing to buy that in Dracula? I mean, you talked about like this grounding in reality, but like he just happens to go to Whitby. He just happens to attack Mina Harker's friend who Harker is still imprisoned in Transylvania and then in a nunnery somewhere with the sketchiest uh, matron ever. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the um, the answer is that in Dracula, the, the the plot, the story is so compelling that I think we're willing to overlook that. But it, but those coincidences have been fixed by some of the screenwriters. Um, so as I've said several times, I mean, Dan Curtis, for example, explains why we get that Whitby Lucy Mina connection, um, which makes sense, and others have made sense of it that way too. Um, I think that Stoker, I mean, this is hard. I, I've written exactly one novel in my life and it hasn't left my desk drawer. Um, and one of the things that I worried about frequently as I was writing it was, did I remember to put in the connections between this scene and that scene? Because I saw them so vividly in my head 
Um, and I knew why this was happening, but did I, did I put it down on the page? And I think that was what was going on with Stoker too. I think he was in such a, I, I hate to say a hurry. He took seven years to write this book, but um, he had, I think, a clear vision of the story and didn't have a good beta reader to go back and say, you need a little reference here to explain why this happens. But, um, but it works in the long run. I mean, we can, we can fill in those gaps ourselves uh, well enough that we can skip over the part that it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, One of my uh, strange, weird romances that occurs in Dracula, I read it as a romance, is actually, I think <laughs> Wolf Dracula and Bersica. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I think this is the overlooked romance in this uh, Could be, could be. Uh, there's a whole novel there for you, Matthew. I think you should write it. I, the, uh... Yeah. <laughs> But you know, I mean, we've, had, there, we've had so many others. I, I, I have on my reading table, I probably will never get to it, one called Dracula, My Love. You know, we have so many rewritten versions of this. One of my favorites uh, being uh, Fred uh, Saberhagen's uh, uh, conversation. Is it called Com- The Vampire Tapes? No, it's called The Dracula Tapes. Oh, okay, name? yeah. I know what you mean. In, in which... He basically takes, he changes nothing in the story, just gives us a slightly different perspective on some of the things. And uh, it really works. Poor Dracula, how he was, that wasn't a baby in that bag. Uh, well, you know, Harker wouldn't know, right? That's he right. Why would he, he know? speak right? Romanian, though he appears to think he does. Right. So there's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very well done book. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, it's uh, it, it, it re-explains many of these things in a way from Dracula's point of view, defending himself, how wrong he's been. You know, that uh, I'll, I'll is- share with you my comic scene. I like that. I was talking to Kevin Wetmore about my, my favorite potential for comedy. Mel Brooks didn't do it either. But when they get the keys to Carfax Abbey, everything is labeled. And I just picture Dracula with a label maker. <laughs> labels and all the keys and i think that this is a missed opportunity for something <laughs> well there are so many so many lovely things to be comic about in those films but um it, it's part of the charm of of all three of the ones we all, all lovecraft and frankenstein and dracula the, the plasticity of those stories and how they can be shaped and molded and still come out uh, recognizable uh, that, those are stories of great power that, that can do that. Uh, that's what makes them immortal, I think, is that that ability to be reshaped, reviewed from a different perspective. There's a great through line from Frankenstein through Dracula to Lovecraft, too, in that Victor Frankenstein, Jonathan Harker, and many protagonists in Lovecraft, they're going crazy. They swoon, they faint, they... You know, they're, they're the ones in the, in the unspeakable horror that constantly just collapse. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And that was, you know, Lovecraft. It's really interesting. When I when I was um, uh, writing the Lovecraft books, I was working with a friend as an editor, Janet Byrne. And Janet, when she read my introduction, in which I explained how both of Lovecraft's parents had died in an insane asylum, basically, uh, and that he must have been petrified of going crazy himself. It's like, oh, that's where that theme comes from. Yes. Because that's what, you know, over and over again, absolutely, you have these these normal people um, experiencing things outside their normal experience, wondering if they have gone completely off the rails. Um, And, you know, no, they haven't. They're just experiencing parts of reality uh, that humankind haven't experienced before. So, but yes, it's again, this goes back. Thank you for bringing this up because this ties back to the theme of the whole talk here about the reality of horror and, and how to make it work. Um, if you have a truly crazy person, for example, The Outsider, Lovecraft story, The Outsider, um, that guy's really crazy. Uh, and he's crazy from day one. Uh, and he's a completely unreliable narrator, and and it makes the story interesting, but not very scary, because in my, in my view, because um, we can't relate to the 
to the protagonist. He's just nuts. Um, and, and having experiences that are so strange and bizarre that they, they can't, we can't relate to them. So I think it's a much more interesting story when you have somebody like the hero of the call of Clulu, um, or at the mountains of madness, um, a, a perfectly normal person, um, discovering that there's more to this universe than they ever thought. It's the same in like, um, the thing of the doorstep, right? I mean, obviously it's about Lovecraft's ex-wife, but there's an element of schizophrenia. Yes. To it as well. Oh, I mean, absolutely. He can drive or he can't drive. I mean, there's all these weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, he does, he does explore that. I mean, Haunter, Haunter of the Dark is about a guy basically slowly going crazy by looking out the window at this, at this church um, that he's gone over and visited and now looking at. Um, and so... Yeah, it isn't all um, normal people just sort of having normal. <laughs> they, they do go crazy. Some of them actually do go crazy. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, that's that's an interesting idea because, again, I, I situate Lovecraft back in time, personally, uh, into the 19th century and how I think about his construction of stories and also just the his reviews of 19th century stories, people like Poe and, and uh, Stoker. He reviews Bram Stoker's Dracula as well. Sure. Um, well, and, and then, he tried very hard to write like somebody from the 18th century. Um, you know, he imagined himself an 18th century gentleman. So, uh, yes, he, he liked that antiquarian approach to things. And yet, you know, he's, he, he writes about motor cars and photographs and science that, of the day and so on. So, you know, it's an odd pairing. He's a, but they fail, okay. right? Technology always fails in Lovecraft. Uh, well, it fails because um, there are things that haven't yet been figured. I mean, does it fail in At the Mountains of Madness? I'm not sure I could say you could say it fails. The science fails. They, they get away. Um, and uh, um, in, in, I'm trying to think of other situations of technology. So... Uh, the shadow out of time. Um, it's about a technology for time travel. Um, it doesn't. It, it, it's, it, science doesn't fail in that story. Well, that's that's more science fiction. I mean, like the actual technology that exists at the time fails, and generally, in relationship to the horror, well, or it just reveals more horror. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, running the idea of running a phone line down into a cavern uh, under the earth, you know, that's an interesting idea. And it ultimately, <laughs> it, it, it fails. Yeah. Because a demon answers. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> like technology just leads to worse. Pl- I mean, that's a very romanticist view of the world. I think that's right. And it, it reflects Lovecraft's own um, sort of struggles to deal with the science of the day. Uh, where he resisted the whole Einsteinian uncertain and the Heisenberg uncertainty principles and all that, he, he finally came around. But he he liked the more classical science. Um, but I think it's also interesting because I think he felt that ultimately science would lead us to this enormous sense of wonder, um, to the discovery that there were things out there beyond our ken. Uh, that that's well, where the science was going to take us. I guess I bring that up too, just because if you look toward the beginnings of romanticism, again, going back to madness, there is an obsession with madness. And particularly if you look in visual art of the time period, madness is constantly repeated. You see it in Goya, you see it in Delacroix, you see it in Gro, you see it in Jericho. Um, right. Just- and you see it as a common theme in the 19th century with the, uh, uh, Heisman and some of those writers, you know, the French especially. Um, so, yeah. But but in Lovecraft's case, I think it was deeply personal. I think oh, he sure. really wanted to explore this idea of sort of the taint in the blood um, that was going to drive him mad eventually and, uh, and, and, and others who, did, who denied it. Others who sort of weren't willing to admit that they had these taints in the blood, whether it's Arthur German um, or uh, uh, many others of his characters that have deeply flawed ancestries. Uh, rats, in the, rats in the Wall is a good example of that. So, um, 
Yeah. So that was a theme that was close to his heart and it comes out in the stories. No, no question about it. But I'm thinking more, I'm back to your, does science always fail? In the shunned house, science does a good job of wiping out that whatever it was. Uh, and uh, those guys took care of it with big bottles of acid. I guess I'm more thinking, I mean, like the particular where science does a terrible job, of course, is the color out of space. Uh, where I mean, they're so bungling, they're almost like out of Amelia's film when they come out and scoop stuff out of the meteorite and take it back to their lab. I mean, you picture them in their full professorial gowns almost, as I say, right. Amelia's. <laughs> right. Well, so back to John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, it's sort of uh, science maybe gets it right. Maybe science bails them out at the end. We're not quite sure. Um, but uh, I mean, that, that's, that's the theme of much 20th century horror um, that, you know, science is sort of a good try, boys, but not quite. Well, I mean, uh, the thing happens because they drop the blob down there, isn't that one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but failed science uh, or sort of miss conceived science has been a constant theme. The scientific monsters have been around since the 50s. Uh, and, and, but these are early examples of sort of similar ideas. That, but, uh, I mean, you know, the fly, the blob, it came from outer space, all those wonderful things that uh, uh, the ants and them, one of the scariest movies I remember from being a kid. Uh, Were you a drive-in kid? Did you go to the drive-in? Once in a while, but we had a local theater that would show this stuff too. Oh, so okay. uh, this is this was the fifties when parents were, uh, you know, if it was a it was a Tuesday tots and teens matinee, it was okay. Okay, they didn't they didn't go see what the film was; they just knew it was okay. So, so we you saw a William Castle film. fan too. Oh yes, oh yes. Did you get to see any of the like ones that had like the stuff rigged up in the theater? No, I never got to go to a theater where the the, the tingler. Yeah, or any of those great things. Or the or skeleton 13, flew 13, up. Thirteen ghosts. Yes, you know some of the great ones like that. Uh, what was the haunted? What was the haunted hell? I'm trying to remember the name of the haunted house one. Oh, haunting house. Yeah, uh, with the where again spooks coming out from the screen. No, I yeah. didn't get to see those with with all the effects. Okay, I, we were I'm we're so in a suburb. You know, I'm I, disappointed for you. I, I would love yes, to go to a tingler where your butt gets shocked while you're watching the movie. Exactly. Exactly. One of the theaters where they had nurses stationed outside in the lobby, you know. Or uh, him chasing down Joan Crawford with an axe. <laughs> Which happened at some of them. Um, let me uh, go to your, your forthcoming book then with uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, is it the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Hi. The Strange Case of Jekyll and Hyde, yes. Dr. Um, Jekyll and Hyde. Let me ask you, what, what, what was a sort of surprise discovery uh, in your research for that? That's a good question, um, for which I am not prepared. Let me think about that for a minute. Uh, I, again, I think that um, one of the surprises is how different the films are. Again, I mean, sort of, you know, having seen, and I've watched, I, I, had, I watched, 10 different versions of the film, starting with some very early silent films and uh, uh, the John Barrymore film, Frederick March and so on. And how many things are wrong in the films. I mean, they're basically sort of missing the point of the book. The whole point of the book, as G.K. Chesterton famously said, is not that Jekyll and Hyde are one become two. It's that the two are one. That this is all, this is one person who has all this inside him. And that's really what Stevenson was interested in. And it's not, the books see it as sort of a release of the evil and isn't that terrible, look at that evil thing that's now running around. And of course that wasn't what scared the crap out of Stevenson. What scared the crap out of him was the understanding that this evil was inherent um, in lots of people, um, including himself, he felt. Um, 
So that was the biggest revelation of, of that was to look at the book and how seriously that theme is developed versus the filmic versions, um, which have seen it as sort of, oh no, we transferred poor sweet Dr. Jekyll into a monster. That's not what happens. Dr. Jekyll is not really a very nice person. Um, when he has a dark history that he is suppressed for a long time, we're not quite sure what it is. Uh, you know, that's uh, boy, there are so many themes in that book uh, that, you know, was it a homosexual past? Was it a, a, a prostitute that he regularly saw prostitutes? Uh, did he have a terrible gambling habit? We don't know. But, but there's a lot of uh, discussion about his earlier sins um, that he's now sort of repressed and covered up. Because um, the counterpoint is John Utterson, right? That's the actual sort of like, yes. I don't know, to borrow from Nietzsche, the, 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 Apoll the actual Apollonian is Utterson. <laughs> Yeah, Hutterson, I mean, is unfortunately not as well developed as one would like, but but again, a character is sort of pretty much absent from all the film and stage versions. Um, this lawyer who uh, steamiously, you know, doesn't drink, um, uh, his friends describe him as boring. This is a, believe me, I can relate to this, uh, you know, as a, as a lawyer. Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's sort of that dull, dull person uh, but he's a good man, um, and he takes his responsibilities very seriously. Um, and he too is kind of shocked by this revelation that uh, that Jekyll has had this dark past. That's interesting. I mean, um, I, I, I guess to think about all three of these, we've mentioned the Coppola Dracula, we've mentioned the uh, the Kenneth Branagh Frankenstein, which was actually produced by Coppola. Um, I guess. To complete the 90s trio for you here, we have Mary Riley uh, right. as the Jekyll and Hyde entry here. What was the, in your, in your uh, estimation, what is the 90s fascination with gothic uh, horror? Public domain material. Hey. <laughs> Didn't have to pay those screenwriters a lot. They just stole from the best. Uh, so... No, I think that uh, it, it's kind of <laughs> the real answer is it's a paucity of imagination by Hollywood. Uh, it's like, what can we do? Oh, yeah, let's remake that one. Um, so it's been remade 37 times already. Let's redo it again. Um, you know, because in Hollywood, I, I, I have many clients in Hollywood and, um, you know, it's always everybody. It's a race. Everyone wants to be the first to be second. That's a that's an important saying about Hollywood. Uh, you don't want to be the first because that involves actual risk. But to be the second, uh, the person who's, who copies something that was successful, um, that's a good thing. So that's a lot of what these are. Um, I think it's like, well, I can make it look original. I can make uh, Julia Roberts the hero of Jekyll and Hyde. You know, why not? Uh, you, can, you can just hear the elevator pitch uh, by the 22-year-old studio executive uh, saying that this is a good idea. Um, or, uh, or for uh, Frankenstein, we have this really long tube. It kind of looks like a contraceptive and De Niro will sort of come out of it and uh, it's going to be great. Um, you know, thank it's goodness. Great... When, when you look at, when you look at uh, some of the other successes, when you look at, for example, Mel Brooks's films, I think he had difficulties making those films because they weren't going to be just copies. They were going to be original and funny and uh he had a lot of trouble with young frankenstein until he finally found a studio that would make that um, there's a great book that talks about the ad campaigns in england about the 92 dracula and the um the brenna frankenstein and it contrasts just like the slight difference in the cast's age but how dracula was portrayed as so much more sexy than the mary shelley's frankenstein um, right. Well, well, right. And, and, uh, you know, it was a different emphasis. Product, I don't know what to say about that one. It, the beginning of it is, is, is okay. It, it does a nice job of sort of telling the story of Victor as a young man, but then it just goes off the deep end. Yeah. And, and I, I love the deep end. I mean, believe me, I, I love things like Penny Dreadful, the wonderful series by John Logan. Um, 
you know, looking at some of these terrific characters and playing with them in new settings and new relationships and all that, you know, I'm all for that. I am not a purist. I mean, how could I say I was a purist if I've told you how my favorite Frankenstein film is Mel Brooks, you know? So you, you get where I'm coming from here. Um, appreciate the original material, know it well, and then do interesting things with it. And frankly, that to me was the biggest disappointment of both of those films is they didn't do interesting things with the material and they didn't stick to the original. And they affixed uh, the author's names to the title. <laughs> right, right. So, well, that was a good thing to do because it was a clue that it wasn't going to be anything like the original. So, well, if you listen to Coppola talk about it, you know, he, he really thinks it actually is. It's kind of strange. Um, I guess uh, to finish here, since that's probably uh, something, something you, you experienced in real time and something I'm obsessed with is uh, going back to Dan Curtis. Uh, Dan Curtis plumbed all of these uh, in Dark Shadows. Shadows, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, vampires have been around in our imagination for a long time. And um, if it's, that's why I say, if, if it's affectionate, it's great. Uh, I have no problem. For example, Sherlock Holmes. There are over 250 Sherlock Holmes films and television series and on and on. I have no problem with those as long as they're affectionate, as long as they appreciate the original material um, and then play with them. Um, it's when they're deadly serious and tell you that they're trying to reproduce the author's vision with just a few changes <laughs> that we're in trouble. I mean, it's like the Hound of the Baskervilles. No one has ever filmed the Hound of the Baskervilles the way that Conan Doyle wrote it, ever. And there's been, what, a dozen versions of it or something? And it's like, why? Because they think they've got a better idea. So I'd rather see Peter Cook and Dudley Moore sure. doing the Hound of the Baskervilles and saying, we're going to have a lot of fun. We have a lot of original ideas. Uh, and so that's to me that that's my tastes. What can I say? I have low tastes. I mean, I think theirs is the best version of Faust too. So, <laughs> so many, so many, and 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 of course the devil. I mean, bedazzled is one of my all. Yeah, that's favorite. what I was saying. That's my favorite Faust. Is Peter Cook yeah. as the as Mephistopheles Lucifer? Is, Just terrific. Is... My favorite scene of him is sitting on the top of the garbage can and having. Poor Dudley Moore walk around going, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, you're... et cetera. I like uh, it when he steals the old lady's, uh, her berries and he's eating. Yes. <laughs> wonderful bit after wonderful bit. And it's just the film that doesn't get any appreciation anymore. So. Yeah, that's a fantastic, because they remade it with uh, Brendan Fraser, but uh, it, it, the Dudley Moore and Peter Cook uh, Bedazzled is, is a fantastic film. Yes. Um, but I, if we're going to wonder... talk about the scariest film ever made, seconds with rock hudson okay you ever see it i have not i'm gonna, I'm gonna write that down oh it is and there's zero supernatural in it and it'll scare the crap out of you uh uh for classic movies i usually get a rebecca just because <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll check this one out okay um, I want well, to this has been so, a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, this is this is uh, this is what I was hoping we would end up doing, which is talking about everything. Now, awesome! I, I I had a great time, and I want to thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. It's a it's been a real pleasure, and uh, I I will look forward to tuning into future episodes of the Spooky Evenings. How many more are there? Uh, what's today? <laughs> the, uh, today 20, is the... twenty two more. Twenty two more. Okay, um, go for yeah. it. Uh, Happy Halloween, like, everybody, and uh, enjoy. Uh, I, I want to invite everybody to uh, take the survey that Juan is dropping into the various chats right now. also want to invite you to tune in tomorrow night for Bernadette Califel uh, and remind you to always stay spooky. <laughs> thank you once again. I, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, And I'm so glad I managed to say something coherent on the subject to start and then we could get into the better stuff so. yeah I, I um if you're willing i'd love it when jekyll and hyde comes out i'd, I'd love to come have an in-depth on jekyll and hyde that'd be that'd be fun matthew that'd be great it's um, uh, i'm not sure i was just thinking this morning i don't know the pub date um but uh, it's coming out it's from mysterious press um it's 
it's going to look like a Norton book. It'll be big and heavy and lots and lots of pictures, lots of pictures. Uh, I was really excited to see how many um, illustrated editions I could find that are public domain, where I could use the illustrations. They're great illustrations. So, and of course the films, many many stills from the films. So, I went to the uh, pirate house this summer. Speaking of Stevenson and Savannah, uh, where supposedly I mean he right he supposedly wrote some of this stuff from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Great. Well, I'd love to do that. So uh, get back in touch when when uh, you see the book is out, or I'll I don't know if there'll be any publicist working on stuff or not. We'll see. So. Yeah, it's it's weird times. A lot of people have been telling me about some of the trouble they've been having with various uh, traditional modes. Yes. Uh, of production. Yes, but on the other hand, I've also been doing a lot of this, a lot of virtual appearances. So okay. uh, this is this is easy. I, you know, go appear at a bookstore in Texas or Massachusetts or whatever. You know, without having to fly there is a, is easy and, and a treat. So, well, okay, well.